saw it on Linden Street. Hello, and welcome to I Saw It on Linden Street, the show dedicated to the joy of finding an appreciation in cult films, exploitation oddities, beloved classics, and all points in between. I'm your host, Chris Roberts, inviting you to join us here at the Linden Street Cinema Experience Theater as we once again dig up a fun cinematic relic from the past. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this isn't your standard film review. Rather, it's a synopsis of a film that we feel deserves to have another inspection. A little background thrown in on the actors, information on the director, and if I'm doing my job at all, perhaps you'll get a half amusing story out of me. Fair be warned, while we don't cover all aspects of the plot, we do discuss endings and spoilers. So, if you'd like to be surprised, please give the film a viewing before you listen to us. If you like us, and hey, I would hope that you do, please recommend this podcast to a friend, give it a favorable review, subscribe. So, it's June, summer's here, and we are continuing our theme of Blame Canada. That's our curated selection of some underrated and overlooked Canucksploitation classics. And this week is no different. We delve into some wonderful literary-inspired drive through fare with the Bob Clark classic 1974's Death Dream. Join us! Okay, so... Full disclosure, nothing about this week has actually gone really right for me. Don't get me wrong, nothing's gone wrong per se. I haven't had anything horrible befall me. Um, Nobody's really, you know injured there's there's nothing to truly hate but just just about every little thing that's happened this week has kind of been a step back um like capping it all off to stuff not going right uh just just yesterday we hosted a few people over and i ended up getting a horrific sunburn so i am just sliding back and forth here with the headphones on in the little studio we have covered in aloe vera and wishing that i didn't itch so much so that all being said Full disclosure for all of you, this week's movie was not actually the original film I had in mind when I was scheduling all of this out six months ago. You see, my original pick was going to be to do a deep dive into 1981's The Pit. Great little monster movie, we we absolutely will cover it. But I'm going to call an audible and bring in a different picture based on a conversation I actually had with my folks about movies this last week. So I'm going to shelve the pit. We'll save it for a future month. I don't, I don't know. We can do some kind of salute to evil kids or something. You see, I had made a comment that I was kind of torn on my selections for this month to my parents. And my parents being my parents, they're both incredibly supportive, but most of the time they don't know what the hell I'm talking about. They asked me what I was actually thinking of doing, and thus, I brought up the fact that, well, I got this cool little low-budget cheesy monster movie, but then there's this really cool early Bob Clark film that's based on the classic literature story, The Monkey's Paw. And when they both in unison said, what's that? The die had been cast. So, if you're already familiar with the story of The Monkey's Paw, please bear with me. I'm doing my best to expose people to music, literature, and media in my own, albeit clumsy, fashion. So what you got here is your standard great piece of short fiction. It's a fantastic little horror story from British author W.W. W. Jacobs, and it was initially published in a collection of supernatural short stories entitled The Lady of the Barge back in 1902. Here's the irony. While the story itself is a fantastically crafted and well-paced horror tale, Jacobs himself was best known for penning farce. He write you know, working class comedic stories, the likes of which earned him great respect for contemporary authors such as P.G. Woodhouse, who was a noted British humorist of the day. And I have to say, again, as a story, The Monkey's Paw is a goodie. You have Mr. and Mrs. White an older couple who live in their modest home with their 20-something-year-old son, Herbert. An old family friend arrives one night for dinner. 
Army Sergeant Major Morris, who has returned from serving over in India. He tells stories and shares his woes, revealing a mummified monkey's paw that he had purchased from an old faker when he was overseas. A terrible spell has been placed upon the twisted limb, and it will grant the possessor three wishes, but each one comes at a terrible cost. Morris breaks down, admitting that the charm has caused him nothing but sorrow, and he throws it into the White family's roaring fireplace. Mr. White thinks Morris is overreacting and saves the charm from the fire, prompting an angry Morris to depart, but not before telling Mr. White that he is indeed sealing his fate. Mr. White wishes for enough money to pay off the family home, which in his mind would give him everything he wants out of life. And upon making the wish, the paw moves and curls its fingers closed. They all go to bed, and the next morning, Herbert leaves for his job at the local factory. A short time after he has departed, a courier shows up at the White residence and informs them that Herbert has been killed. Not just that, he's been horrifically maimed in a machine accident at the factory. The company is making a goodwill payment to the family, the exact amount of money that the elder White had just wished for. The Whites are devastated, of course, with the loss of their son, and in the coming weeks, Mrs. White begins to lose her senses due to her extreme grief. Knowing the paw does indeed work, she implores her husband to wish that their son return back to life. He does so very reluctantly, but spends the next few hours worrying about what is exactly going to show up at their house, all too aware of the state that Herbert was in when he died. Then they begin to hear something banging at the front door, something attempting to get into the home. When Mrs. White insists it's her son, it's Herbert, they need to let him in. Mr. White is terrified as to what the thing on the doorstep really is, and he uses the remaining wish to send whatever was there away. While his wife finally gets the door open, she finds just the empty night and wails in frustration and despair. Alright, so I'm not going to be, like, you know, reading books on tape, but that's a great piece of creepy prose right there. And it's become a story that is usually taught when students are in middle school or high school. And it's been portrayed in many a stage play, radio show, short film, and even television episodes. And more importantly for pop culture, it's been adapted and satirized by a slew of various films, TV, and stage productions. Perhaps you've heard of some of them? The Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt, Are You Afraid of the Dark, The Monkees, The X-Files, Adventure Time, Creep Show, and of course, my very favorite adaptation, and at least that's not this week's film, the 1991 Simpsons Treehouse of Horror number 2, which has given me and my wife a shorthand code for letting each other know not to deviate from the instructions given. So there you go. If you ever want something done right, you just tell somebody you don't want any zombie turkeys. It's absolutely influenced other literature. There have been a host of comics, short stories, and whatnot that have cribbed from it, have done homage to it, or have just blatantly ripped the story off. Hell, Stephen King used the entire concept to basically build his novel, Pet Cemetery around. The notion of wishing someone who has died that could be a very, very bad idea if they ever actually came back. So, of course, I'm telling you all of this to set you up for the fact that this very famous 
well-known, at least unless you're related to me, short story was the perfect vehicle to be retooled into a slick, low-budget horror film sprung from the mind of screenwriter and special effects man Alan Ormsby and directed by one Bob Clark. What? You've never heard of Bob Clark, you say? Jeez. Okay. Here, I'm going to put on a pot of coffee. We're doing this. Benjamin Bob Clark was born in New Orleans on August 5th, 1939. He grew up poor. His father died when Bob was still in grade school and his mother was forced to work as a bartender to support him. He was, though, a natural athlete, and he did end up earning various football scholarships, one of which got him to Hinsdale College in Michigan. But he actually gave up several offers to play professional football, focusing instead on something he truly loved, film. Clark started off a little bit slow, working on a bunch of small B-movie fare. His feature directorial debut came in 1967 with a film entitled She-Man that was a gender-bending drive-in feature about a soldier who is forced to take estrogen and ends up dressing as a woman at the behest of an angry and violent transvestite. As of a couple of years ago, you could still find this out of the Something Weird catalog. I don't exactly think it's been translated to DVD yet. Not saying it's good, but it is definitely a drive-in Z-grade film. His next feature, 1972's comedic horror story, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things, was a cult project that actually put Clark on the map, and it cemented his collaboration with a bunch of his college friends working on featured films, uh, specifically with one Alan Ormsby, who was the co-writer, as well as the actor and effects man for the picture. Sidebar, it is a great low-budget gem of a film. Ormsby is this temperamental and jerky director who ends up taking a theater troupe to a small island that is used for a cemetery for a bunch of horrible criminals, and he plays what he considers to be acting games. So, of course, some over-the-top theatrics occur, and what they believe are fake rituals to raise the dead turn out to be real rituals, and suddenly you get a bunch of mincy actors who are fighting for their lives against some very real zombies who have come back angry. It's a real good time. And again, because it was a good time, it was a minor hit, and that touched off the drive-in circuit and uh, got Clark known, and he began to be the guy you go to for some cheap exploitation quickie films, the kind they like to crank out and take advantage of. So Clark ends up reinvesting his earnings and produces and directs his next project, a treatment written by Ormsby that was originally entitled The Night Walker. They found joint backing from a Toronto-based film studio called Quadrant Films, who in turn also brought in the London-based Impact Films to get this project made. So there is our distinct Canada link. Except... They decided to film it all in Brooksville, Florida. So, you get that? We got a Canadian film company who's going to take London money to finance an American filmmaker to shoot in Brooksville, Florida. We all good? We on the same page? Good. Alan Ormsby was tasked with getting together special effects, and he in turn hires this cocky up-and-coming actor-turned-special-effects guy as his assistant. This little chap named Tom Savini, who, if you know anything about the horror industry, he was responsible for teaming up with George Romero on many of his films, including Dawn and Day of the Dead, Dawn of the Dead being 1978, Day of the Dead being 1985. You know, I feel Savini actually needs to get his own deep dive from us at some point in the future to truly do him justice, but for now, all you have to really know is Savini grew up being a monster kid, loved horror movies, loved special effects, and he actually then went to Vietnam to be an army combat photographer. And while he was there, he came away with some horrifically accurate knowledge about what dead people actually look like. He also came back with a pretty bad case of PTSD, and thus he could actually be a problematic guy to work with for other actors and directors. But again, all of that is going to be a story for another day. For the role of Andy, Clark, 
cast the up-and-coming Richard Bacchus, uh, primarily due to his ability to have this stone-faced stare. He just could sit unblinking with a really creepy, deadpan expression for an extraordinary period of time before then being able to burst into a display of murderous rage. Actress Lynn Carlin and actor John Marley were cast as Christine and Charlie Brooks, uh, Marley being one of the two big gets for the film. He was just coming off hot from playing uh, a small role in Coppola's The Godfather. He, you'll remember, was producer Jack Waltz, you know, the guy who gets the horse's head placed in his bed. Both of them had actually previously worked together on the John Cassavetes film Faces, so them playing a couple actually kind of works really well here. Surprisingly, the biggest get for this film, the role of Dr. Allman was portrayed by Henderson Forsyth, who at the time was best known for his 32 years of playing Dr. David Stewart on the famous soap opera As the World Turns. This was his first real big break into films. I feel I could give you more, but you've really been patient as to this point, so how about we just slide into that trailer? What do you say? Dead of Night, the story of one night in a small town that changed the lives of many and ended the lives of some. Where you headed? Come on, hop aboard.
due to the importance of the first five minutes of Dead of Night, audiences will not be seated after the beginning of the picture. We open on American soldier Andy Brooks being killed in action during the Vietnam War. Upon hearing of their son's death during a family dinner, the Brooks family is, of course, devastated, with Andy's father, Charles, played by John Marley, breaking down and hugging Andy's sister, Kathy, played by Anya Ornsby, while Andy's mother, Christine, played by Lynn Carlin, screams at them, insisting that this is a lie, a mistake. Andy isn't really dead. And she rushes from the room. Later that night, Charles wakes up and realizes that he's alone in his bed, and he goes looking for Christine, only to find her in Andy's room, praying and speaking to a lit candle as if she is talking to her son, stating, I know you're alive. I can tell. I can feel it. They've lied, and you'll come back. We cut to, later that night, a truck traveling. The driver... We learn his name later as Howie pulls over to give a lift to a single hitchhiking soldier. The passenger stays in the cab while the driver pulls into an all-night diner to grab a couple of cups of coffee to go, and he mentions to the waitress just how weird it's been having the soldier in his cab. Hey, Ed, here comes Howie. Hi, Rosalie, what do you know? Why don't you shut off your engine and stay a couple of seconds? Nah, I'm running later than hell tonight. Just stopped by for a pack of smokes. Hey, Ed, give me two black coffees to go, will you? Right. Hey, who's riding with you? Hey, don't tell the boss. It's just a soldier I picked up. Bad boy, Howie. You know you're not supposed to pick up hitchhikers. I needed the company. It turns out I should have left him on the road. How come? Mm, he's a real weirdo. He hasn't said two words since I picked him up. Not even a thank you. Oh, well, what kind of a soldier is he? There's or ours? Ours. Good. Um, I thought we were being invaded. Here's your coffee, Buster. Come back and see me sometime. Thanks, Rosalind. I'll see you on Friday, okay? Later that same night, Kathy wakes to hear something downstairs, as if somebody is in the house and rushes to wake her father. Charles draws a pistol and he heads downstairs, wary of what they may find, only to be stunned to see Andy, as played by Richard Backus, standing eerily in the dark corner of the house, alive and well. The family, of course, is thrilled, but Andy is a little stiff, a little off. To us, I was getting so worried. I can't believe you're really here. You know they sent us a telegram tonight. Can you imagine those idiots in the State Department? They had you, had you in your grave. Oh, how did you get here? Do you want something to eat? Do you want some tea? Kathy, make him a cup of tea. Oh, God. I'll go get what? you some tea. Hey, you know Joanne calls. She wants to see you. Everybody's been yeah. calling. Everybody's Oh, 
<laughs> Andy awkwardly smiles, they share a laugh, and they all go to bed. The family unit is together again. In the morning, local Dr. Allman, as played by Forsyth, is performing an autopsy. You see, Howie, that truck driver, he was found murdered inside of his truck cab, just on the outskirts of town. And the good doctor notices that even though his throat has been torn out, he's got puncture marks all over his arms. The police begin investigating, and they do find out when they talk to some of the people at the diner that there was a hitchhiker that Howie ended up picking up. A returning serviceman who was considered to be a weirdo. And so the local police start looking around for soldiers who've returned to the area. Sitting in the yard the next day with his family, Andy ends up having a very awkward exchange with the neighborhood postman, who himself is very happy to see that the Brooks boy has come home. The mail carrier ends up joining the family at the backyard picnic table, and it all seems to enrage the young man when the World War II vet tries to reminisce about his own feelings when he returned home from war. His father and his sister are rather embarrassed and are unsure of what to do. It's also noted that the family dog Butch doesn't seem to care for Andy anymore and avoids him, growling. Andy spends all of his time either sitting in a long chair in the front of the yard or up in his room, not speaking, not eating, sitting in the dark, rocking back and forth in a rocking chair, slowly irritating his father and causing his family to worry about him. Charles and Kathy see that there is a problem, but Christine will not have anyone speak ill of her son. And there were severe wounds in the abdominal region. Police report the presence of puncture wounds in the victim's right arm. Police spokesman refused to speculate about the significance of these wounds. Witnesses report that Mr. Stewart, a resident of Waynesville, had picked up a hitchhiker. And first reports from the scene indicate that the hitchhiker... Hey, turn that off. I wanted to hear the news. What's the difference? You can't hear anything anyway. That door's going on up there. Doesn't bother me. Well, it bothers me. It drives me nuts. Honey, you can't expect everything to snap back to normal in just a couple of days. It takes patience and time. Is that what it takes, Christine? Well, I'm certainly glad to do it. That's what it takes. Everything's going to be all right, Charlie. I won't have it any other way. Why is he so different? Charlie. Won't talk with us. He won't eat with us. He sits out in the yard all day long and up in his room. Why won't he let us tell anyone that he's home? What do you do, take a ball? Tell him to see us something? Only been home for two days. I know that, I know that. Whose side are you on? It isn't the question of that. Isn't it? If you cared anything about him, you'd be patient with him. You'd give him some time to adjust. God, with what he's been through, I can't even imagine the terrible things that he must have well, seen. Well, I went through it, too, but when I came back, I didn't act like well, that. Well, you're not Andy, and you don't have the same kind of sensitivity. Well, it's my son, too, you know. He didn't get that precious sensitivity just from you, you know. Well, he didn't get it from you. All you've ever done is criticize him and pick on him and ride him. If it hadn't been for you, he wouldn't have enlisted in the first he place. He enlisted because he didn't want you to turn him into a goddamn mama's boy. And he was right. Well, I happen to love my son, even if you don't. Andy comes downstairs and announces eerily that he's going out. And then he just walks around town, eventually making his way to the town cemetery, where he lays down in front of a headstone and begins to scrape at the dirt with his bare hands. The next day finds Andy posted up in his usual spot in the yard with a number of neighborhood children stopping by to see him and talk to him. While the kids get all animated and start, well, you know, being kids, asking him questions about the war, asking him questions like, now that he was in the army, does he know karate? 
When one of the boys enthusiastically makes a chopping motion with his hand, Andy grabs it and starts to hurt the child. Butch, the dog, intervenes, and in front of the children, Andy picks him up with one hand and strangles Butch, much to their horror. Charles witnesses the tail end of this and is both horrified and angered at his son. He thinks Andy has gone crazy, and he goes to a local bar to mourn the family dog and to talk about his problems. It's there that he runs into Dr. Allman, and after having a talk with the doc about the current state of things, they agree that it may be a good idea for the doc to stop by and pay Andy a real visit. At home, Christine is still delusional, telling Kathy that she shouldn't believe anything her father says about either her or Andy, and that everything is just fine. When Charles returns to the house with Dr. Allman in tow, she tries to stop them from speaking to Andy, insisting that there's nothing wrong with him and he's just resting. The doc goes upstairs with Charles and ends up having a very stilted conversation with Andy, where he does, though, find out that Andy indeed hitchhiked into town with a trucker, causing the doctor to worry. After they depart, he turns and tells Charles that he examined that murdered trucker, and noting that he does think it's probably just a horrific coincidence, he's going to have to still contact the police and tell them that they need to talk to Andy. Charles does ask if the doctor can at least wait until tomorrow, and the man begrudgingly agrees. When Charles returns to go back into the house, the rocking chair is now empty, and Andy has gone out the back and taken the family car. Doc Allman gets back to his office and has a private moment of worry where he tries to hem and haw over actually calling the police. He does call the station, but he hesitates to answer when addressed. And that's when the phone line goes dead. There are footsteps out in the hallway, and Dr. Allman goes out to see who's actually there and has a confrontation with a now very different-looking Andy. His face seems to have aged. His pallor is almost completely white. He is quite menacing, and he wants to chat. I just came by to shoot the breeze. You invited me, Doc, remember? Well, Andy, if you need someone to talk to, I'm more than willing to help. I want you to know, Doc, that I'm in perfect health. Not a living soul in better health than I am. I don't have to worry about getting sick or old or tired or hungry or anything. Well, maybe one thing. What do you mean, Andy? Feel my pulse, Doc. Randy, I... Feel it. I don't understand. There isn't any heartbeat, Doc. No heartbeat. You 
killed that truck driver? I died for you, Doc. Why shouldn't you return the favor? Andy attacks and kills the doctor. He does so by stabbing him with a large boar hypodermic needle that he takes from Almond's lab. He then ends up removing some of the blood from the doctor and injecting it into his own body. In the morning, a now chipper and again young-looking Andy is back in his parents' home. He learns that his sister has set up a double date for them and has contacted Andy's girlfriend Joanne, as played by Jane Daly, to meet up with Andy. Her and her boyfriend Bob, as played by Michael Mazes. Charles tries to talk to Andy, have a one-on-one sit-down with him, and explain the concerns that Doc Allman had shared with him the night before. But Andy tells his father that he doesn't have any problems in the world, and it's going to be all right. Andy does end up joining this group for the double date, but he does so wearing large, dark sunglasses at night, and he uses leather gloves to cover up the visible withering of his own hands and he makes a point to ask Joanne not to touch him. It's a little awkward, but they all end up leaving, first to grab a bite of food, and then the plan is to go take in a local movie at the drive-in. Charles goes into town and discovers that the doc himself has been murdered, and he is sure that his son has done it. He attempts to go to the police by himself and share that he thinks it is Andy, but he just can't bring himself to turn in his own son for murder. Christine is at home, and she also hears the news that the doc has been killed, and in a moment of panic, she realizes that Andy most likely did murder the man. When Charles comes home, Christine attacks him when they suggest that Andy did it. She blames him, telling him that it's all his fault. She instead offers to take their son away forever. They'll go on the run. But Charles refuses. He instead grabs his pistol and announces he's going to go out there and find the kids. Christine then lies to him, telling him that they all went out dancing just to throw Charles off the trail and to buy Andy some more time. At the drive-in, Kathy and Bob leave to get some concessions, Kathy, of course, thinking she's giving her brother and Joanne some much-needed alone time. Joanne does try to open up to him, telling him how much she's missed him and how she wants to pick up where they both left off. But she's horrified as Andy starts bleeding from his scalp. He starts to break down in front of her. Joanne tries to back away from him, but he locks the car doors and then attacks her, pulling his sunglasses off to reveal that his eyes have turned a pale milky blue and his face at the corners. It's clearly starting to rot. When Bob and Kathy return from getting concessions, and when they don't see either Joanne or Andy at least, quote, sitting up in the back seat, they end up chuckling happily thinking they've gotten the lovers back together. They slide into the front seat and jokingly tease, hoping that they aren't intruding on the lovebirds way out there in the back. And that's when Andy, now almost completely transformed into a living corpse, rises from the back seat, where it's revealed he's already killed Joanne. He attempts to grab for and strangle his sister, but Bob manages to hold him off and tells Kathy to run. Andy then turns his full focus on Bob and strangles his one-time friend with the cord from the drive-in stereo box. Andy then attempts to take the family car and run his sister down, but his sister is pushed out of the way by a fellow drive-in attendee, and Andy ends up plowing into the young man, instead killing him before taking off for home. You see, the problem is people have now seen Andy. They've seen what he's done and the police are going to give chase. Andy does arrive home to find his mother waiting for him, trying to get ready to help him escape. 
Charles, too, returns home and brandishes a gun at his son, only to have Christine stand in his way. Andy, please, please come on, we've got to leave right now. Andy, please. No, children. Where's Kathy? No. No! Stand up, Andy. I don't care about Catherine! No, Charlie. Oh. Stand up, Andy, and face me. No. Andy, no. stands and it's revealed that he has turned into a complete horrific walking corpse charlie finds himself unable to kill his son but thinking andy has killed his daughter he walks away from the two of them and retreats to his own bedroom where an off-screen gunshot signifies his fate Christine attempts to get Andy out of the house, and as they are exiting, they're confronted by the police, who shoot Andy several times, but he just keeps walking. They get into the family car and drive off, but not before an errant shot from the cops strikes the gas tank, causing the back of the car to burst into flames. Christine is completely unhinged at the moment and begs her son to tell her where she should drive, but all Andy does is reach over and grabs the steering wheel, spinning the flaming vehicle into the gates of the Brooksville Cemetery. They both exit the car, and Christine begs and sobs, trying to get Andy to stop as he crawls to the spot that he has been visiting since he first came home where he has apparently dug a grave for himself. A crude headstone, everything is there. As the police approach them, they find that there's a sobbing Christine and the half-buried corpse of her own son. Andy is now again, this time truly dead. Christine cries and the credits roll. Good times. Where do we even begin? I mean, let's start just in general by praising the performance by Bacchus. He is fantastic here. The deadpan delivery, the intense anger when he then drops the facade of, quote, being his old self. His playing of violence as a revenant is one of the best thing that this film has going for it. And for my money, nothing beats the scene where he stares at his father, who in delight says, We thought you were dead. And Andy's chilling, I was, retort, coupled with a very awkward, forced smile is so chilling. The best way I can describe it to somebody who's never seen this, if you have seen the overlooked Adams Family Values comedy movie from the 90s, when Christina Ricci is playing Wednesday Adams and she's trying to show that she's forcing herself to smile as if it's painful, Bacchus is doing that just here, but instead of doing it to get a laugh, it becomes this completely unnerving experience. His slow and steady decay, it's so marvelous on screen that it's done incrementally with slight touches that by the time we get to the end where he's become this walking corpse version of himself, it actually seems so natural and horrifying that we've gotten there. Uh, It's not just done to shock, I mean, it's like he's just barely been able to keep up the appearance of having 
unnatural life over these last few days when in fact he is indeed this rotting corpse. The slow, steady pallor changes, the wrinkling and the cracking of his skin, the sunken and later discolored eyes, and finally you're left with this walking zombie who is starting to just desiccate. It is all so wonderfully done by Ormsby and Savini. It is truly a masterful take on watching someone who's dead who doesn't know it. I'll freely admit, I've said it before, I'm not actually a huge fan of films where animals are hurt or killed. Now, in horror films, I will make an exception to the rule if it serves the story, but, you know, those have to be well done, and they're usually few and far between. I will say right here, right now, this is one of those times when it's done right. Shockingly, the animal actor that played Butch the dog was an animal that had actually been adopted from the pound only a few weeks prior to filming, but that didn't mean he was any less beloved on set. Savini himself was tasked with making a special harness that would allow Bacchus to pick the dog up one-handed, but the harness allowed it to fully support and keep the dog safely in place, ensuring that no harm would actually come to the real Butch. So what you get is this horrifying moment, which comes from only seeing the bottom of the dog's legs, and then, of course, cutting to Andy with his look of rage, as he, of course, is str supposedly strangling this dog one-handed. And it's all the audio cues and the music that ramp up the actual horror of the situation, which leaves you with a scene that's both powerful, shocking, and does the job of being horrifying. Bacchus actually did have a single close call on the set. In the final chase scene, where Christine and Andy are actually fleeing from the cops, the car catches fire due to the gas tank taking a hit from an errant bullet from one of the cops. Great. It's written into the script. We know it. Bacchus himself was stationed in the front seat of the car for a bunch of close-up work that is going to have him grappling with a police officer who's trying to stop him. Then he kind of shoves and pushes the man out of the window, and it's going to cut to a long shot of Bacchus driving away. Well, from the back of the car, it's going to show the vehicle is indeed in flames. So, they set the car up for the shot. The back set is going to have the back window shatter out to look as if the car is indeed being shot by police officers. And then the rear gas tank is going to blow, creating that fire effect. As an afterthought, one of the stunt techs decided it would be a good idea to put a plexiglass divider between the front and the back seat of that car. The line is set, they're going to get the shot, action is called, and Bacchus and the stunt driver find themselves barreling down the road with the back of their car on fire. That is, until the back windshield breaks out as it's supposed to, to show the fake bullets hitting it. Well, that rush of oxygen into the back seat by way of the exploding window, that created a mini backdraft effect, if you will, which then sucks the fire that is on the back of the car into the back seat, causing the entire back seat of the car to suddenly be engulfed in flames. Bacchus starts panicking, wanting the car to stop, and the stunt driver keeps going, wanting to be done with the shot. Both, however, were saved from the flames thanks to that single pane of plexiglass that was put in again as just a passing afterthought. When it was over, Bacchus exited the car and noted he was thrilled that the shot was over. He didn't ever want to do something like that again. Only to have director Clark come up to him and say, We gotta do it all over again. There's just too much fire in that car. <laughs> what a crazy story. This film does have a slight alternative ending. Uh, some versions, and the movie has several titles and therefore, quote, several versions... Uh, most of them all end the same way, but there is an extra snippet of dialogue that was thrown in from Christine that actually was tacked on to the version um, 
with one of the worst names, entitled The Night Andy Comes Home. In that version, the film ends with Christine weeping at the grave, again being surrounded by police, but then speaks to the police and to the audience and states, Andy's home. You know, some boys never come home. And then same thing. Credits roll. The movie ends. Uh, I'm kind of glad they didn't do that. It, it seems to be just as powerful leaving it as it is. He's a zombie. He's dead. At the end, he knows he's dead. And at the end, he buries himself in spite of his weeping mother. While we're at it, just to get into how many different versions of this film slash different titles this film has, this film was released on the drive through circuit as the following. The King from the Grave, Dead of Night, Death Dream, The Night Andy Came Home, Death Behind the Door, It Came from the Grave, and The King of the Grave. So many. But that's what drive-ins did, but still, especially the King titles, what were they thinking? All right, let's get back here and let's close the loop on director Clark. He's going to go on to continue to make some really great B-movie fare over the remaining years of the 1970s, uh, Black Christmas being a fantastic slasher, which was also released in 1974. And then he would slowly work his way into making some more decent films before he would have his real cinematic payday that would come in the 1980s. You see, depending on your view of things, you either have Clark to blame or to thank for directing the first two Porky's films. And all of that, I would argue, gets forgiven or gets trumped by his then teaming up with the great American humorist and writer Gene Shepard. Because you see, in 1983, they created the now seminal classic, A Christmas Story. And I say that to then turn and say to you, you know, it doesn't much matter what I say after this point, does it? You know that whatever I tell you, Clark's legacy is at least secured in the world because he gave us Ralphie and his lusting for that own Red Rider BB gun. You know that it's an amazing story and it's so well done. And that's good because a lot of what Clark did after that was slum it. I mean, every once in a while something interesting would pop up, but hey, he ended up making Rhinestone with Sylvester Stallone and Dolly Parton. He did Loose Cannons with Gene Hackman and Dan Aykroyd. Hell, in the early aughts, he was cranking out some really, really bad junk. Stuff like Baby Geniuses and its sequel, Super Babies, Baby Geniuses 2. You know, Clark had been actually in discussions about a remake on this film, but it would never come to fruition, at least not with his involvement. Here's the real tragedy. April 4th, 2007, Bob Clark and his 22-year-old son were driving on the Pacific Coast Highway <clears throat> in Los Angeles when a drunk driver ended up crossing the median and ended up hitting Clark head-on killing both him and his son. It would later be determined that the driver, who of course survived the incident, was three times over the legal limit. Look, I, uh, I know not everything that Clark did was gold, but to see somebody who was responsible for art and entertainment that I know made the world a better place, and, and that made my world a better place, to be taken from this existence in such a senseless fashion is beyond a tragedy. And it uh, actually makes it all the more worse that a young life was so easily extinguished in the process. L at least here at the Linden Street Cinema Experience, we feel we owe a debt to Mr. Clark for making our childhoods magical and wonderful. So please, rest in peace, Mr. Clark. We definitely feel you've earned it. So how was this film received? Well, Death Dream ended up making its world debut on August 29th, 1974. 
Here's my problem. The film was mainly shown on the Southern Drive-In circuit when it was released, so there's not a lot of you know, box office data that's readily available to share because each drive-in basically did its own books and reported its own numbers. So the production company Nightwalk Productions, which was basically established to release the film by Clark and Ormsby, I can tell you they took an ad out in the drive-in trade magazine stating that in 1974 at least this film made $65,000 in the first four weeks that it was shown at a single Tampa, Florida drive-in. So based on that fact and how it played on the circuit, there is no doubt in my mind that this film recouped its cost and actually made a tidy profit for Clark and company. It of course has developed a cult following on video in the 1980s. That's where I myself ended up seeing it. I was a kid who rented it when I was in high school and then I again rented it when I was in college from the local mom and pop store. It ends up holding an 83% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and it has an average score of 64% with audiences. So I think it's safe to say this is kind of like this weird little sleeper movie. If you know about it and you've seen it, you tend to like it. And hey, why shouldn't you? Now, the version screened here at the LSCE was the 2004 Blue Underground released DVD, and it does come with some fantastic features. It has an audio commentary from both director Bob Clark and from Alan Ormsby. It has two interviews, one with Bacchus and one with Savini. It has alternate opening titles, the extended alternate ending, a theatrical trailer, the posters and stills, and I have to say that's not a bad haul. The version itself is still available on DVD and can be found for sale on Amazon for $14.98. Well worth it. But hey, let's say you want to get this awesomeness on Blu-ray. No problem. You see, Blue Underground has you still covered, and you can get everything I just stated above and more, because their deluxe 2017 Collector's Edition gives you the dual Blu-ray and DVD combo, and it adds in even more features. Everything I just said, plus new interviews with Anya Liffey and Alan Ornsby, interviews with film composer Carl Zeter, a making of featurette with production manager John Bud Cordos, and some early student films of Alan Ornsby are thrown in, plus there's a bonus collectible essay booklet just coming with film critic Travis Crawford's thoughts on this film in general. All of that can be yours for the low price of $35.35. And if you're asking me, I'm going to tell you that's a steal. Now, please, remember folks, we don't get anything here for recommending that you make a purchase, but we just feel it's important that people keep continuing to support physical media. So you have these great companies who hold the rights to these films that we love and want to see, and they're going to keep distributing that content. And at the end of the day, isn't that what's important? Besides, Death Dream is this really unique, cool, and fun film, and I guarantee it is something that your average viewer has not seen. And you guys don't want to be average, right? So what are you waiting for? Go out, get yourself a copy of Death Dream today. You won't regret it. So that's going to wrap things up here for this episode of I Saw It on Linden Street. Thank you so much for joining us. If you like us, please give us a favorable review on Apple Podcast. Swing by, check out our website, lscep.com, where we have articles, episode links, and comics for you to peruse. We're also featured on Podchaser. That's a podcast database for listeners and creators of podcasts alike. Find us there, give us a follow, and a review if you please. More reviews make us more searchable, and then we can keep sharing with more people. As always, if you'd like to get in touch with us, make a comment, ask a question, send us wonderful things, please email us at lindenstreetcinemaexperience at gmail.com. If you'd like to be even more personal or wish to contribute a segment on the sidecar, please, by all means, send us an audio message by way of Anchor. That's a free and easy app to use. So until next time, take care out there. Wash your hands, stay healthy, and please remember, life's too short not to live in the past. Take it easy out there, everybody.